After decades spent traveling the world and picking up university degrees from Jerusalem, Harvard, and Geneva, Dr. Ron Brown settled in New York City in 1992. He's been teaching history, ethnic studies, and political science at Toro College and world religions at the Unification Theological Seminary for over 25 years. He's been deeply involved in the cultural life of New York City through his work as a featured speaker at the New York Historical Society, New York Council for the Humanities, and numerous other libraries, historical societies, colleges, and universities. So today we're very happy to welcome back Professor Brown to look at another neighborhood here in New York City, uh, Fifth Avenue. So welcome back, Ron Brown. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jeff. And it's wonderful to be back at uh, Port Washington uh, Library, even though if I'm sitting in uh, lockdown in my neighborhood in Elmhurst, Queens. I'm just a um, couple blocks away from Forest Hills, which is bright red on your maps, as you see every day at the New York Times. And I'm in the orange zone, but still, uh, all of our libraries are closed. All the colleges are closed. My campus is shut down. So it's a really uh, fascinating time, which I'm sure historians like myself are going to be writing books and give talks about uh, far into the future about the great pandemic. Well, once again, I just like a summary, we've been spending the last couple of talks dealing with our own and beloved uh, New York City. Uh, for those of you who have been loyal followers, you've noticed we did uh, Flushing, where religious freedom was born. We did Christopher Street, where the whole gay movement began. Uh, we've done the Lower East Side, the, the first stop for new immigrants, historically. Uh, we did Harlem, and today we are doing a street, which most people don't consider an ethnic neighborhood, but actually it is. So today we're going to discover Fifth Avenue, not the usual just strolling up and down the street, but find out how it came into existence and what it represented. It's more than just another street. It is a city within a city, very much like Flushing or Harlem or the Lower East Side was, but a very distinct society. Hmm. So, as you can see, the title is Fifth Avenue, the ideal human society, the perfect human society. Fifth Avenue didn't just happen. It was fashioned, it was shaped, and it was given its personality, which it has until today. So as you can see from the outline, we have a lot of talking to do. So um, we'll see how the Fifth Avenue emerged, its history, who settled there, the merchant world, the flowering of Fifth Avenue with Civil War millionaires, and then the plethora of houses of worship where the rich and the super rich build their churches and synagogues to thank their respective gods for their economic success. The city of mansions, private clubs, elite shopping center, and finally, monumental public building. So let's get going. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, I will speak. And if you have questions, type them into the chat line or at the very end, uh, Jeff will throw open the mics and you can give your oral comments, uh, whichever you like. Okay, let's get started. Well, first and foremost, a well-regulated society it has been the ideal of humanity ever since we stopped following a bunch of uh, camels and sheep and cows through the tundra or through the steppe. Soon as we started organizing cities, soon as we started organizing states and countries and later empires, People had to say, well, how are we going to organize this society? Well, historically, the leadership of a country has been determined usually by God. So in the upper left, we see the emperor of China, who claimed to have been appointed by God and enjoyed the mandate of heaven. 
In mother societies, we had Abraham and Moses who were called upon by God to run the society and organize it. In the Middle Ages, the emperor or the king was crowned by an archbishop or even the pope himself to give legitimacy to his perfect society. And in fact, if anybody had any questions about who was running the show, well, you always had the king's army who would impose order. So you had the ruling class in the middle somewhere. You had the merchant class. The bottom left, we have always had stores and bartering and everything. And so you had the merchant class. And at the bottom on the right, we see that we had always a slave class of people, whether they're called untouchables as in India, or whether they are African-American slaves in the Americas. And central to any well-regulated society is marriage and the family. The father is the head of the family. The wife is in the kitchen taking care of babies. The children are obedient to their father. So the family has been a centerpiece of every society. I mean, until today, uh, a stable society is the basis of a strong society is the family. I mean, uh, so the family values, as any good Republican will tell you, is the basis of society. Well, these visions of society have been um, enshrined by religions. On the left, you see the caste system of India. The Brahmins at the top, the warriors and kings below that, merchants and landowners, then come commoners, peasants and servants, and of course, the outcasts who have no standing in society. Well, this was also reflected in ancient Chinese society, Confucianism, the emperor at the top, the palace and the court and the government, followed by the peasants, the artisans, the merchants, and of course, the slaves. And so every society has its rigid order. In ancient Israel, you had the king Solomon, David, and Saul at the top with the priestly caste, the Cohens and the Levies who had a monopoly on priesthood. You had the merchant class, and at the bottom, you had the slaves. What did King David do when he conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites? He killed all the adults, and he sold all the children as slaves. So it was a very rigid society, always attributed to divine plan, God-organized societies. Well, unfortunately, in the United States, God, um, uh, if he was intervening in human history in America, most people were too busy making a living to uh, listen to, to God. From the very beginning, when we were 13 colonies along the Atlantic coast, we were a diversity of races, language, cultures, and religions. New York was a Dutch reformed colony taken over by the English Episcopalians. You had the German Amish in Pennsylvania. You had the French Huguenots in New Rochelle, the Puritans up in New England, and the fearsome Presbyterians in New Jersey. So the United States began as a dumping ground. Uh, Israel Zangville coined the term the melting pot, the great American drama. We were creating a brand new society. What kind of society was this going to be? Well, nobody knew. It was happening before their eyes, but nobody really knew how our society was going to be organized. Well, we did agree that we were gonna have a president, but he was gonna be limited to two terms, eight years, and then he would disappear back into Texas or California or Florida or wherever, and then there would be a new person. So we really had no divine social organization. It was up to Americans to decide what kind of society are we going to have? Who is going to rule? who is going to have major influence, 
and who was going to be at the bottom of the social pyramid, the equivalent of slaves and serfs in ancient times. Well, that's where Fifth Avenue comes into the uh, story. On the left, you see the old Dutch city with the Dutch wall, and you see Broadway going right and left, leading up into the middle of Manhattan. The English took over in 1664, and they um, continued Broadway up through the depths of Manhattan. New neighborhoods were built above Wall, uh, the Wall Street, where the wall was torn down and turned into Wall Street. So you had like a layer cake. Below Wall Street was Dutch. Above Wall Street was English. So you already had the beginning of a social organization in New York that would reflect the American immigration experience. Well, the first person who took New York very seriously and saying we are organizing a new society was our good friend DeWitt Clinton, man who was, as the name implies, a perfect New York Knickerbocker, a DeWitt, good Dutch, Huguenot, Dutch um, reformed stock, and a Clinton good English stock, the perfect New York Knickerbocker, spent his entire life as a politician running New York, first in the New York legislature shortly after the revolution, spent a miserable year in Washington as a senator, as a senator fled, came back to New York, and spent the next 25 years as either mayor or governor. He was the one who put New York on the map and took seriously the future of this city. He's the man who built City Hall in 1811, the largest, the most expensive and the most elegant City Hall ever built in the young United States. He was the one who gave us the grid plan, those wonderful streets and avenues, which still are the pride of Upper Manhattan. He was the one who envisaged the city of the future. In fact, he was criticized when he built this new city hall, all this marble and gilt and statues and everything. And everybody said, why are you building this monstrosity of a city hall for a town that had no more than 40,000 people. They criticized him when he had the grid plan and not only made the map, which you see on the right, but sent surveyors in with little stakes to lay out the streets and avenues at great expense. And he, again, he was criticized and he said, mark my word, one day New York City will have a population of a million. Well, of course, everybody thought the man would start crazy, but nonetheless, this is what he had as a vision. Well, there was one area which we see sometimes on the map, and that is called a potter's field with a hangman's elm, and that is today Washington Square. And you see 4th Street up to uh, uh, 8th, 6th Street, um, cutting across streets and avenues. Well, by 1797, it was a potter's field. That meant where you buried the unwanted dead. There was the hangman's elm where you hung criminals. By 1826, it was smoothed over and turned into a parade ground for military uh, exercises by following year, it was made into a public park named after the wonderful George Washington. Well, it was a nice park laid out in a rapidly expanding city, but it really didn't have much of a character. Uh, New York was expanding northward willy-nilly, building what it wanted to where it wanted to. But if you look at the map on the right, you see Washington Square and you see Fifth Avenue emerging from the square and going north. All the other avenues go north and south down to where they hit the old uh, Dutch and English city. 
Fifth Avenue is the only street that does not go beyond Washington Square. Therefore, nobody wanted to live there. They wanted a street where you an, or an avenue where you could jump in your carriage, zip downtown to Wall Street, go to work, jump in your carriage, and go home. Fifth Avenue was a dead end. It went nowhere. It just emptied onto Washington Square. Well, this had a disadvantage, Washington Square and this dead end Fifth Avenue, but it was quickly recognized by the old Knickerbocker elite, the blending of Dutch, French Huguenot, Germans, English, and Scottish, who had been in New York since colonial times. Well, gradually, like DeWitt Clinton, these families intermarried and they created a new class, which until today we call the old Knickerbockers of New York. Names which you'll recognize, Stuyvesant, Peter Stuyvesant, the Livingstons, Rhinelander, Roosevelt, Delancey, Fish, Pindard, Beekman, Jay family. These were the New York City elite. And we see the growth of population, 25,000 at the revolution. Uh, by the time um, DeWitt Clinton was taking over, it soared from 80,000 up into over 100,000 by the Civil War, crossing the 1 million mark. Well, who were these people flooding into the city? My God, they were nothing but Euro trash, impoverished Irish Catholics, which nobody would even pay attention to, German immigrants coming in. My God, they didn't even speak English. How civilized could they be? So these old, old Knickerbocker families began to fear for their power and prestige in the city. And they said, well, here we are living all over. We're scattered all over the city. What we should do is create our own neighborhood. Well, gradually people like John Jacob Astor, who made his fortune in furs, a German immigrant, intermarried with old Knickerbockers, A.T. Stewart, retail, the Jones family. You ever hear of Jones Beach? That's where we get the name Keeping Up With The Joneses. They were always one step ahead in what French women were wearing the cut of men's suit in England, the latest Spanish or Portuguese wine. The Rhinelander family made a fortune in sugar, the Stuyvesants, great landowners, Roosevelt owned land, James Lennox, a merchant. They said, we have to get organized, create our own city within a city. Well, by the early 1800s, Washington Square, nicely laid out, new trees planted, was beckoning these old Knickerbockers. Come, take over Washington Square, build your Greek revivals, what they call federal style buildings. Red bricks, two Greek columns in the front, very simple on the outside, because good Protestants didn't flaunt their wealth like people do today. They had a very austere, simple outside, bricks, few decorations around the door, the classic Dutch stoop going up several stairs into the front. Well, they gradually started taking over Washington Square. And here at the bottom, you see a row of these brownstones, vast majority, with little decorations, very simple, uh, a garden in the back, uh, and the stoop in the front, carriages going back and forth. And they claimed Washington Square as their hometown. Federal architecture, classical Greek influence, Three windows wide, never more, a basement area for the cooking and the laundry and the female staff. Um, whether they were of red brick or of brown stone, they were called simple federal, New York federal brownstones. So this became the architectural style of the New York City Knickerbocker elite. 
Well, of course, as soon as they started taking over Washington Square, I mean, they did have to thank their respective gods for giving them such a wonderful um, financial success. Washington Square built the new South Dutch Reformed Church in 1840. A couple years later, the Presbyterians from Scotland up at 12th Street on Fifth Avenue built their first Presbyterian church. First Presbyterian remains one of the most monumental churches on Lower Fifth Avenue. The South Dutch Church was eventually um, destroyed and replaced by buildings of NYU. NYU was established in 1831, and here we see the old building, which is no longer standing there, facing Washington Square. It was called the Presbyterian University. Presidents were always either Dutch Reformed or Presbyterians, two religions which are very, very close. There's almost no difference between them, except one is Dutch and one is Scottish. And so the presidents were um, clergymen of either the Presbyterian or the Dutch Reformed. So the first settlers at Washington Square built their federal style buildings, they built their churches, they founded their own university, and gradually they started spreading up Fifth Avenue. This was the Episcopal Church of the Ascension, 1841, which still stands. Now, these were austere Calvinist Christians. You know, remember, John Calvin said, if you are a good holy person and work hard, God will reward you with my financial success in this world. You don't have to wait to go to heaven and have some happiness. You could have it here on earth. So these churches of Washington Square were very severe Calvinists. No stained glass windows with Jesus and Mary and the saints. Picture on the right is typical of a stained glass window in a Dutch reform, the Presbyterian and the early Episcopal church. There was no church organ. There was no organ when Jesus was being crucified. There was no organ playing in the background at the Last Supper. So if it's not in the Bible, get rid of it. There's no altar. The central focus is the book, the Bible and the pulpit no graven images or paintings. These were hard-working New York Knickerbockers, very proud of their success, and their financial success was a gift, a blessing of God, just as poverty was a punishment from God for not being a good Christian. So John Calvin ruled over Washington Square with an austerity. Alcohol was forbidden, card playing was forbidden, dancing was forbidden, luxury food was forbidden, lace on women was forbidden. It was an austere society that started moving up Fifth Avenue, creating their own world. Now, of course, John Calvin was Swiss but he inspired the Scottish Presbyterians, the Dutch Reformed, the English Puritans, German Reformed Christians, not those hellbound Lutherans, French Huguenots, not those Catholics. So it was a rather unique world that staked out Fifth Avenue as its own. Now, of course, these glorious days of Fifth Avenue are well chronicled by um, Henry James, Washington Square. Uh, Edith Wharton wrote her books on uh, old New York. I mean, this was the centerpiece of uh, Washington Square. Now, if you look at Edith Wharton's book, you'll see New Year's Day. The Dutch and the English and these fierce Protestants did not celebrate Christmas, because there is no December 25th date in the Bible. And so Christmas is a heretical holiday. 
but they sure went wild when it came to New Year's because everybody needs some fun once in a while, even a bunch of strict Calvinist Protestants. Well, gradually these people started building their brownstones, moving up Fifth Avenue, moving beyond Washington Square, staking out their ethnic neighborhood within a neighborhood. Now, you might not think of the old Knickerbockers as an ethnic group, but their sense of solidarity, of a similar history, similar success, and a similar mission in this world really forged them into a new ethnic group. Well, things were going fine as Fifth Avenue pushed its way up into the heart of Manhattan. Well, a whole new group of people elbowed their way onto Fifth Avenue, and these were the Civil War millionaires. Well, great fortunes are made in every war. A.T. Stewart, an Irish Protestant immigrant, arrived in New York with nothing, and he decided why should the rich women of New York go around in their carriage to the hat shop, to the meat shop, to the glove store, to the dress store, bring them all under one big roof so they can be dropped off at the front door from their carriage. They can go in, spend the day shopping until they drop, have tea, socialize, away from the streets where the beggars and the poor and the Irish and the Germans were hanging out among their own. So he's the father of the department store because it brought many different departments under one roof. Well, Henry Steinway was another person who made a fortune during the Civil War. A.T. Stewart became a millionaire by catering to the wartime traffic. Is war good or bad for business? I always ask my students. It is great. Fortunes are made. The only people who suffer are those who um, become soldiers and get killed, but no rich person is going to go to the war. Well, Heinrich Steinweg migrated to the United States and opened up his piano factory up in Steinway, Queens. Well, of course, during the Civil War, he was not making grand pianos. He was making other things out of iron and steel like railroad carriages, like steel for bridges, cannons, guns, bayonets. And so a German immigrant by the name of Heinrich Steinweg, A.T. Stewart, an immigrant from Ireland, ended up becoming millionaires. Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, even though he was an old Dutch stock going back to the colonial period, well, his family never moved beyond New Dorp in Staten Island, where he had his ancestral farm. But the Commodore was not going to sit out the Civil War when fortunes were to be made. He got a little boat and started bringing his own produce from New Dorp to Manhattan, the booming markets where soldiers were rotated in and out for training. A second boat was added, a ferry between Manhattan and Brooklyn and over into New Jersey. In fact, he had so many ships plying the East River, the Bay and the, um, and the Hudson River that he adopted the name Commodore. Well, he had no official title of Commodore, but he was a ship owner. He moved to Washington Square in a and uh, uh, after his fortune started growing. In fact, he, he moved there in 1846, but then when his fortune was growing, he told his wife back in New Dorp one day, honey, get the, f I think he had 15 kids at the time, get the 15 kids ready because we are moving to this new square. Well, his wife had no intention of leaving her family home in New Dorp and taking all of their gang of kids 
to Manhattan. Well, nobody stood up to Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he said, any person, man or woman, who dares stand in my way is obviously insane. So he had her closed up in an insane asylum until finally she realized that after all, maybe I do want to move to this new emerging neighborhood. The Warburg family, German Jews, settled in the South, moved to New York, major uh, dealers in slaves during, before the war, and then cotton after the war, they ended up moving to this new street. So for the first time, you had Jews showing up, mingling with the old Knickerbockers. No, nobody was really too happy about having them there, but on Fifth Avenue, wealth is what determines the elite. Andrew Carnegie, came to New York, made a fortune in the coal industry in Pittsburgh, and rose to become one of the wealthiest men during the years following the Civil War uh, called the Gilded Age, the House of Morgan. Finance, here again, one of the great ruthless robber barons who staked out Fifth Avenue as their own. Well, once again, just like the old Knickerbockers, the new gangs of people building on Fifth Avenue, claiming elite status, of course, they built their houses of worship along Fifth Avenue. We see St. Thomas Episcopal Church. Uh, there was one there before that, built right after the Civil War. This is the newer one, built uh, after the first one burned down. Fifth Avenue Presbyterian. I mean, here we see already the name. Fifth Avenue had prestige. It's not St. George's Presbyterian. It's not the Holy Trinity Presbyterian. Well, even more important than the Holy Trinity and St. George, of course, is Fifth Avenue. And so God has clearly smiling on this new Civil War gilded elite. Even the Irish Catholics got into it. They see in the middle picture there, old St. Patrick's Cathedral with a wall around it to keep people from stoning the church, keep the Protestants, the rednecks, uh, the nativists from attacking the church. Well, Dagger John, who was the archbishop during the Civil War and after, said it is time for the Irish to move out of the Lower East Side ghetto and take over the city. He was the one who laid the cornerstone for the monumental St. Patrick's right on Fifth Avenue, saying, move over Protestants, the Catholics are here. Now he was called Dagger John because he carried a dagger in his boot and said every Catholic had to have a dagger. And if anybody touched one of his Irish Catholics, that would be the last person they would ever touch. So the Jews and the Catholics started moving into this new growing ideal city of the wealthy. The German Jews began in 1846 in a little storefront chapel at the bottom there. Doesn't look very much, but that's where Temple Emanuel was organized. Gradually, they moved uptown. The picture on the left, we see their big new Fifth Avenue, Temple Emanuel, beautiful Gothic style church with Oriental flourishes built right on Fifth Avenue. Well, this was the flush of Jewish power from Civil War fortunes. Today, they've moved a little bit further uptown, and here we see the current Temple Emmanuel. So Irish Catholics, German Jews, all kinds of other people were moving to Fifth Avenue. The key was financial success. An elite was being born. Now, this was very important for New York because every city in the world had its elite. You had your royalty throughout Europe, and you were born and bred to royalty. 
Whereas the United States, we never had a, uh, a Baron of the Bronx, a Marquis of Manhattan. We had ordinary people. So our elite was one day you rise, the next day you fall. You have to constantly defend your membership in the Fifth Avenue elite. It was not granted by God directly, but once again, God presided over Fifth Avenue because as the good Protestants and eventually the Catholics and the Jews agreed, material wealth was a blessing from God. Now, another major sign of Fifth Avenue being transformed into heaven on earth were the glorious mansions. Now, at the top on the left, you see the red federal style Washington Square style of architecture. Three windows wide, very little ornamentation on the outside, very uh, Calvinist austere. Well, the new post-Civil War millionaires were very happy with this type of rather simple architecture. They wanted houses in marble. And so at the bottom, you see A.T. Stewart's house on Fifth Avenue, three floors tall, balconies, and most scandalous was the mansard roof at the top. Now you say it's beautiful. Well, of course it's beautiful. But who invented that? That was Monsieur Mansart in Paris. He came up with the idea of placing the top floor sort of under the roof. Therefore, legally, it was not considered a floor. So this house had one, two, three floors. Actually, it had four, but the top floor was sloped on the outside to look like a roof. So you only paid taxes on three floors. Well, the good Dutch Protestants said, oh my God, this is unbelievable. God will strike the building with lightning. Well, of course, A.T. Stewart um, went ahead anyway. Now, he was a gilded person. This was the gilded age. Gilded meant you had tons of money on the outside, but don't ask what was under the thin layer of gold. So Fifth Avenue started booming. More and more mansions were going up and no longer simple brownstones or um, Calvinist style buildings, but mansions modeled after those of the princes and the barons and the dukes of Europe. Commodore Vanderbilt took over an entire section of Fifth Avenue from St. Patrick's up to Central Park. And that was Vanderbilt Row. And every time someone in his family, one of his many children got married, he would build them a mansion. There's only one mansion still standing. And that is currently, I believe, the Cartier shop. And that was for one of his, I believe, unmarried daughters. So it was rather modest, but it's the only one left. All these other mansions were torn down. Because by the uh, late 1800s, Commodore Vanderbilt had gone beyond ships and was taking over the railroad. The Varborg clan, which made a fortune in civil war and after built the famous Varborg mansion along Fifth Avenue, one of the most elegant mansions, fashioned again after a French chateau in the Loire Valley with beautiful Gothic ornamentation. Well, this is today the Jewish Museum along Fifth Avenue, one of the few glorious mansions of the age which is still standing. Andrew Carnegie realized that if you're gonna be anybody in America, Sure, you can have your steel mills and your coal mines and everything in Pittsburgh, but if you don't have a Fifth Avenue mansion, you are a nobody. J.B. Duke, tobacco king of uh, the Carolinas, also migrated to New York and built his mansion. 
Madame Restel, an Irish immigrant with her husband, came over. Well, she definitely took advantage of the Civil War. Think of all these young soldiers in their 17, 18, 19, and 20, rotating into New York to be trained and prepared for war, and then shipped off by railroad to the battlefronts. Well, these young soldiers, if it was their last night in New York, uh, maybe one or two of them went to church to say a prayer, but most of them were out to taste of life in the big city. Well, prostitutes abound. They were everywhere. And Madame Restel was considered the queen of the life of these ladies. To have a Restelian at that time was to have an abortion. She came out with the very first condoms, all kinds of ways of inducing abortions, of avoiding pregnancy, uh, creams and powders and whatnot for syphilis and gonorrhea. She became the richest self-made woman on Fifth Avenue. And there you see her mansion. I mean, one, two, three, four floors carriages in and out. She would ride daily in her beautiful carriage through the newly opened bottom half of Central Park. Well, she was a bit much for these New York um, robber barons and gilded. I mean, she was definitely gilded. I mean, her table manners were atrocious. Her English was horrendous, but she had money. But still, it was not enough for her to get accepted into the flourishing great New York Fifth Avenue society. She eventually committed suicide in her ornate bathroom. See the book on the right, Madame Restel, the abortionist, the wickedest woman in New York. But still, very characteristic of this newly emerging post-Civil War Fifth Avenue crowd. Now, if you are a member of the Fifth Avenue elite, you can have all the money in the world, but you are still going to remain at the level of Madame Restel unless you get invited to join a private club. Next time you think up the New York Times, go to the obituaries and read of old New Yorkers what they say about them. And they will inevitably list which private clubs they were a member of. The Union Club, the Knickerbocker Club, or many of the other clubs. You have to be invited to join. You have to be sponsored by other equally respectable, wealthy, qualified people. On the right, we see the Knickerbocker Club as it looks today, with billiard rooms, swimming pools, jacuzzis, saunas, half a dozen restaurants, bars, reading rooms, even hotel rooms at the top for members who are visiting from out of town. You had to show your pedigree. You had to prove your wealth and your worthiness to be invited to join one of these clubs. Now, in the beginning, of course, uh, no trash people were admitted. And what did that mean after the Civil War? That meant no Catholics, no Jews, of course, no Blacks or Hispanics or uh, Native Americans or Chinese. They were still relegated to good Protestant families. Well, uh, of course, that would eventually change. You had the Harvard Club, once again, a sign of belonging to the elite. I go there every year for their big annual Christmas party since I'm uh, an alum, but I don't like the Harvard Club because it's all um, medical doctors and lawyers who look down upon people who graduated in any of the other Harvard schools. But you can see, founded 1865 at the very end of the Civil War. Now the Jews, like, so often, a group that's, that's not allowed into the old clubs, what do they do? They establish their own club, and they become just as exclusive as the clubs which shunned them. This is the Harmony Club, built right before the Civil War. It's called the Gesellschaft Harmony, or the Harmony Society. 
Now, a harmony is still spelt in the German way. These were German reformed Jews, German speaking only. Even a hint of Yiddish would get you blackballed. No yarmulke wearing, strings on your t-shirt, side curls and beards uh, were allowed in the club. They were German Jews, Reform Jews only, the Temple Emmanuel crowd, the elite of the Jewish society. The New York Yacht Club, 44th Street, I love that the, the window there is the back of a sailing ship. Inside one of the best museums and libraries of everything nautical, the clubhouse on Newport, Rhode Island, was founded in 1844 and blossomed with all of the wealth uh, that the Civil War brought. Commodore, um, uh, the Famous Commodore was a um, part of all of this. Now, of course, to be a member, you had to own a yacht and you had to maintain the yacht. You had to appear at the Newport Rhode Island clubhouse periodically. Wealth associated with wealth. Eventually, there were clubs for women. Uh, the Cosmopolitan Club, um, was established, the Colony Club, which again brought upper class women to socialize among other upper class women to arrange uh, 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 correct marriages between the eligible young gentlemen and the women of good quality and impeccable uh, upbringing. In fact, the women's clubs got very um, busy finding not just nice young eligible knickerbockers, but a lot of these women were out looking for an eligible but impoverished English or German or French or Russian Duke, Grand Duke, Prince or Baron, so that they could culminate their climb to Fifth Avenue's wealth and status with a royal title. These were called the Dollar Princesses. Winston Churchill was very proud of his American connections that had um, saved his family from bankruptcy and ruin. And so this was a very, very big Fifth Avenue business and many marriages were held at St. Thomas Church celebrating the link between the wealthy Fifth Avenue elite and the natural born elite of Europe. Now, of course, elite shopping, this is part of New York. I mean, you're not gonna go to a bargain basement if you are worth millions. So Brooks Brothers, which had established long before in 1818, made uniforms for the Civil War officers. And in fact, Abraham Lincoln was shot wearing a Brooks Brothers coat. They moved to Fifth Avenue. Tiffany, established way back in 1837 to provide luxury goods and glassware and carpets, also moved shortly after the Civil War to Fifth Avenue. Saks, Fifth Avenue, once again, if you have Fifth Avenue Presbyterian, you have Saks Fifth Avenue in uh, um, uh, taking advantage of the prestige of Fifth Avenue. So there you went shopping among the elite. Very often people would say, objects in these stores were not marked with a price because if you had to ask the price you were clearly in the wrong store. Harry Winston, Cartier Diamonds and Toys, FAO Schwartz, these were all part of the um, emerging luxury trade of Fifth Avenue. F.A.O. Schwartz, may Friedrich Augustus Otto Schwartz made his fortune making cannons and guns and swords and railroad carriages out of steel during the war, after the war, just took the same factories and they were making 
boys. A Cartier building on the right, another mansion which is still standing by the plant family. The Diamond District, which is uh, today dominated by Eastern European Yiddish speaking Jews, is 47th Street, Harry Winston, who I got to know years ago in Geneva. I worked at the hotel where he stayed in Geneva. We would stay up exchanging stories and him telling me his, his life at the Hotel Richemont in Geneva, which was his European headquarters. Of course, Rockefeller Center, another ornament of Fifth Avenue, monumental architecture, interestingly built during the Great Depression, when so many other buildings like the Empire State Building were built, um, the Chrysler Building, all going up once again, decorating Fifth Avenue. And again, your Christmas tree, uh, the uh, sculptures of um, the Rockefeller Center are an ornament to the Fifth Avenue. Now, Fifth Avenue finally also became a place for great celebrations. It was like a stage where the wealthy showed off their stuff. When you had the great um, uh, celebration of George Washington, they built on Fifth Avenue near Washington Square a wooden arch, which you see on the right, for the great celebration of George Washington. Well, it was so popular that um, wealthy people said, well, why don't we just build a permanent one? And that's what you see today, the Washington Monument in Central Park. Sort of a, uh, a monumental entry onto Fifth Avenue as you walk through from Washington Square and NYU campus today, go through the arch and you enter in grand style to the Fifth Avenue um, expanse. Also after the Civil War Metropolitan Museum, we tend to forget that the great parks like Central Park, the great museums, even the great cathedrals of Europe were built by kings and emperors. But New York unfortunately had no Baron of the Bronx or Marquis of Manhattan. And so it was the wealthy who assumed the burden of building Washington Arch, building the Metropolitan Museum, building the churches and synagogues to decorate their ancestral homeland. New York Public Library at 42nd Street by Carrier and Hastings, one of the most magnificent uh, structures built on Fifth Avenue. Uh, finished in 1911, just before the First World War. Again, a monumental structure with patience and fortitude, the two lions. I never remember which one is which, but uh, that's their names. Uh, the reading rooms inside, where many of the wealthy gave their fortunes. Now, typical Fifth Avenue, if you are somebody you want the world to know. So you put your name, Rockefeller, on a building. Um, and the library itself, it has the names of the great donors, the um, uh, Astor family, the um, S, um, uh, other families who donated their um, library collections to this new emerging public library. 1902, the Flatiron the soaring, magnificent skyscraper, drug Fifth Avenue into the modern era. People were afraid to go in. They were afraid the elevators would crash, but the new safety elevators were um, safe. And this uh, became one of the glorious decorations of Fifth Avenue where Fifth Avenue and Broadway meet 32nd Street. Now, 
that I love this picture on the right because you see it standing there in its glory. Unfortunately, today it's being surrounded by even taller skyscrapers, but from certain angles, you can get a beautiful view. It is called the flat iron. Uh, most people probably know this, but it was the hot iron that you'd put on the stove, uh, which was coal or wood to heat up. And that's what you would use for ironing. It was shaped in that pointed fashion with a flat bottom for ironing clothes. Other buildings went up to make glorify Fifth Avenue, the Plaza Hotel in 1907 with its famous palm court, its ballrooms. I mean, uh, the Hotel of the Elite. I think Home Alone 2 was filmed there, as well as many, many other uh, films. The Empire State Building, 1930, uh, when it opened, monument to Fifth Avenue, but still, it was in the middle of the Depression. So it was nicknamed the Empty State Building because um, New York needed another giant uh, office building as much as it needed a hole in the head, but gradually it was um, filled and became uh, one of the iconic buildings of Fifth Avenue. And this trend to build monumental public buildings on Fifth Avenue continues. The famous Guggenheim Museum, once again testifying to the glory of another great Fifth Avenue family, the Guggenheims, uh, was opened in 1959. See the interior, the spiral snail shape uh, uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Once again, Fifth Avenue does not stand still. It is constantly growing, forging like the Flatiron Building into the future. So that brings us to an end of our whirlwind tour of Fifth Avenue as the ideal human society. Just like the ancient emperors of China or the Hindu rulers or the Jew Solomon and King David in the Jewish Bible or the Holy Roman Emperor, a well-organized hierarchical society was the basis of stability. I mean, remember, St. Paul said, slaves be obedient to your masters. Know your place in the hierarchy. And so New York, sort of by default, very much fell into this pattern, building its own unique, ideal human society with the elite ruling Fifth Avenue. So once again, this is Ron Brown, or you can call me Dr. Ronald Brown if you have any issues or comments or anything. Uh, that's what I look like, and uh, uh, standing in front of the magnificent Plaza Hotel, where someday, if I ever get enough money, I might spend a night. But feel free to send me um, emails or comments or anything that you might have that you'd like to share with me.